John Maxwell, known as America's expert on leadership, speaks in person to hundreds of thousands of people each year. He has communicated his leadership principles to Fortune 500 companies, the United States Military Academy at West Point, and sports organizations such as the NCAA, the NBA, and the NFL. Maxwell is the author of over 30 books, including The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership and Developing the Leader Within You, both of which have sold more than one million copies. Les Parrott is a professor of clinical psychology at Seattle Pacific University. He has written several books with his wife, Leslie, including Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts and Becoming Soulmates. Chapter 1. Start With Yourself If you want to win with people, you've got to be a winner yourself, or at the very least be on your way to becoming one. There's no avoiding this simple fact. Let me say it straight. If you try to practice the ways of winning with people that you are about to learn in the following chapters before you give serious attention to how you could become a winner yourself, you'll be sorely disappointed. However, if you will first take the time to focus on yourself, you'll soon be ready to focus on others. 1. You can't be happy without being healthy. Psychology used to think it was critical to focus on and then eliminate negative emotions. We now know there is a better way. A new generation of research has shifted psychology's primary analysis from that of misery to an understanding of wellness. The new research reveals that you can't be happy simply by being unencumbered by depression, stress, or anxiety. No, you can't be happy unless you are healthy. And there's a lot more to health than not being sick. Emotional health is more than the absence of dysfunctional emotions. Emotional health is at the center of winning with people. Secondly, you can't give what you don't have. Like every other psychologist in training, when I first began my graduate education, I was urged to get into psychotherapy myself. Less, my advisor said, as a psychologist, you will only be able to take a person as far as you have gone yourself. Why? Because you cannot give what you do not have. You cannot enjoy others until you enjoy yourself. The bottom line, if you are not becoming a winner, you will find it almost impossible to win with others. But here's the good news. Your desire and attempts to win with others help to make you a winner. Everyone has little anxieties and insecurities. If I were to ask you to describe a winning person, a person who is whole and healthy, you might say something about this person being confident, warm, kind, stable, giving, and so on. And you'd be right, in a sense. But there's more to becoming a winner than having a list of enviable attributes. Being a winner comes down to one thing, your value. Winners are valuable. Ask any star athlete or gold medalist who has just signed a multi-million dollar endorsement deal. But truth be told, being a winner in the purest sense of the word has nothing to do with your performance, your salary, or your earning potential. It has to do with your value and whether or not you have owned it. When you embrace your own personal value, when you are secure in who you are, then you have become a winner. Here are just a few ways of doing that. Recognize your value. I was on a speaking platform with my friend Gary Smalley when he did something that captivated the crowd. Before an audience of nearly 10,000 people, Gary held out a crisp $50 bill and asked them, who would like this $50 bill? Hands started going up everywhere. I'm going to give this $50 to one of you, he said, but first let me do this. He proceeded to crumple up the bill. Then he asked, who still wants it? The same hands went up in the air. Well, he continued, what if I do this? He dropped it on the ground and started to grind it into the floor with his shoe. He picked it up, all crumpled and dirty. Now, who still wants it? Again, hands went into the air. You have all learned a valuable lesson, Gary said. No matter what I do to the money, you still want it because it doesn't decrease in value. It is still worth fifty dollars. Gary's simple illustration underscores a profound point. Many times in our lives we are dropped, crumpled, and ground into the dirt by the decisions we make or the circumstances that come our way. We may feel as though we are worthless, insignificant in our own eyes and in the eyes of others. 
But no matter what has happened or what will happen, we never lose our value as human beings. Nothing can take that away. Never forget that. Accept your value. How many times have you heard people say, He has issues? What they mean is that the person is stuck. The person is not healthy. He's got a hang-up. He's uncomfortable in his own skin. It's what we psychologists are getting at when we talk about self-acceptance. Let's face it. All of us walking around on this planet have insecurities and issues that we wish we could change about ourselves. But certain things we can't. Some things about us just are. Maybe you weren't born with the kind of looks you would like, or you aren't as tall as you desire. Your genes dealt you a hand that you've eventually got to accept. Either that, or you reject your personal value and spend your days trying to compensate for your insecurities. You become hung up, stuck on not being dealt a better hand. Increase your value. Perhaps you already recognize and accept your value. Maybe you know at the center of your being, deep in your soul, that you are loved by God and are of inestimable value. Congratulations! The next step is to increase your value to others by solving as many of your problems as you can. In other words, you need to maximize who you are by overcoming or fixing those things that are within your power to change. You may struggle with a hair-trigger temper, for example. Maybe you have difficulty setting boundaries or taking responsibility. Maybe you have some bad habits, or perhaps your attitude needs an overhaul. All of us have hurdles we can overcome. Forty-five percent of Americans report that they would change a bad habit if they could. The truth is, they can change. Each of us can improve ourselves whenever we decide to. Believe in your value. Once you've recognized your value, accepted it, and increased it, you've eventually got to believe it. You've got to believe it with such conviction that you'd be willing to bank on it. Chuck Wepner never learned this lesson. As a boxer, he earned the nickname the Bayonne Bleeder because of the punishment he took even while winning. In the boxing world, he was what's called a catcher, a fighter who often uses his head to block the other guy's punches. Wepner continually pressured his opponent until he either won or got knocked out. He never cared how many shots he had to absorb before landing a knockout blow. Trainer Al Braverman called him the gutsiest fighter I ever met. He was in a league of his own. He didn't care about pain. If he got cut or elbowed, he never looked at me or the referee for help. He was a fighter in the purest sense of the word. When Wepner knocked out Terry Henke in the 11th round in Salt Lake City, boxing promoter Don King offered Wepner a title shot against then-heavyweight champion George Foreman. But when Ali defeated Foreman, Wepner found himself scheduled to fight the greatest, Muhammad Ali. On the morning of the fight, Wepner gave his wife a pink negligee and told her she would soon be sleeping with the heavyweight champion of the world. Ali scored a technical knockout with just 19 seconds remaining in the fight. But there was a moment, one glorious moment in the ninth round, when a ham-like paw to Ali's chest knocked the reigning champion off his feet. Wepner recalled, When Ali was down, I remember saying to my ringman, Al Braverman, Start the car. We're going to the bank. We're millionaires. And Al said to me, You'd better turn around because he's getting up. After the fight, Wepner's wife pulled the negligee out of her purse and asked, Do I go to Ali's room, or does he come to mine? That story would be nothing more than an odd boxing footnote, except for one thing. A struggling writer was watching the fight, and then it suddenly struck him. There it is, he said to himself. So I went home and I started writing, and I wrote for three days straight. That's how writer and actor Sylvester Stallone described the birth of the Academy Award-winning movie Rocky to James Lipton on Inside the Actor's Studio. The movie studio offered the struggling writer an unprecedented $400,000 for his script, but Stallone refused the money, choosing instead just $20,000 and the right to play the part of Rocky for actor's minimum wage, a paltry $340 a week. The studio also made an offer to Wepner since the movie was based on his life. He could receive a flat fee of $70,000 or 1% of the movie's gross profits. 
Wanting the guaranteed payday, Wepner took the $70,000, a decision that ultimately cost him $8 million. Today, Chuck Wepner lives in Bayonne and works as a liquor salesman. The same thing happens whenever you sell yourself short. If you don't believe that you have something of great value to offer another person, namely yourself, you'll never truly win with people. Who you are is the greatest asset you'll ever possess. And as long as you recognize this valuable asset, accept it, increase it, and believe it with deep conviction, the ways of winning with people in this book can become a part of your character. And when they come from the heart, they work like a charm. Each of the chapters in this book closes with a piece to help you apply what you've learned. It's designed to help you put the chapter's winning way into action. To apply this lesson from chapter 1 to your own life, forget about whatever makes you feel insecure. Ask, how can I increase my value to benefit myself for others? Do it. List the things you can improve about yourself, bad habits to break, etc., along with specific steps to take to make the improvements. Remember, your relationships can only be as healthy as you are. Chapter 2, Practice the 30-Second Rule One of the most valuable lessons in winning with people that I have ever learned from John is the 30-Second Rule. Within the first 30 seconds of a conversation, say something encouraging to a person. John is a master at it. While I was sitting in a meeting at one of his companies a short time ago, John entered the room and within just a few minutes said something encouraging to each person around the table. David, I heard you hit it out of the park this morning on that conference call. Larry, you're making me look so good with that consultation in Denver. Thank you. Les, I'm so glad you made the trip out here to be with us today. I know you're going to add tremendous value to our discussion. Very early on, John had genuinely encouraged each one of us, and it seemed almost effortless. People everywhere need a good word, an uplifting compliment to fire their hopes and dreams. It takes very little effort to do, but it really lifts people up. John when most people meet others, they search for ways to make themselves look good. The key to the 30-second rule is reversing this practice. When you make contact with people, instead of focusing on yourself, search for ways to make them look good. Every day before I meet with people, I pause to think about something encouraging I can tell them. What I say can be one of many things. I might thank them for something they've done for me or for a friend. I might tell others about one of their accomplishments. I might praise them for personal quality they exhibit. Or I might simply compliment their appearances. The practice isn't complicated, but it does take some time, effort, and discipline. The reward for practicing it is huge because it really makes a positive impact on people. Psychologist Henry H. Goddard conducted a study on energy levels in children using an instrument he called the ergograph. His findings are fascinating. He discovered that when tired children were given a word of praise or commendation, the ergograph showed an immediate upward surge of energy in the children. When the children were criticized or discouraged, the ergograph showed that their physical energy took a sudden nosedive. You may have already discovered this intuitively. When someone praises you, doesn't your energy level go up? And when you're criticized, doesn't that comment drag you down? Words have great power. What kind of environment do you think you could create if you continually affirm people when you first came into contact with them? Not only would you encourage them, but you would also become an energy carrier. Whenever you walked into a room, the people would light up. You would help to create the kind of environment everyone loves. Just your presence alone would brighten people's day. The 30-second rule also instills motivation. Vince Lombardi, the famed Green Bay Packers football coach, was a feared disciplinarian, but he was also a great motivator. One day he chewed out a player who had missed several blocking assignments. After practice, Lombardi stormed into the locker room and saw that the player was sitting at his locker, head down, dejected. Lombardi mussed his hair, patted him on the shoulder, and said, One of these days you're going to be the best guard in the NFL. That player was Jerry Kramer, and Kramer says he carried that positive image of himself for the rest of his career. 
Lombardi's encouragement had a tremendous impact on my whole life, Kramer said. He went on to become a member of the Green Bay Packers Hall of Fame and a member of the NFL's All-50 Year Team. Everybody needs motivation from time to time. Using the 30-second rule helps encourage people to be and do their best. Never underestimate the power of motivation. One of the great side benefits of the 30-second rule is that it also helps you. You can't help others without also helping yourself. If you want others to feel good about themselves and to feel glad every time they see you, then practice the 30-second rule. To apply John's teaching to your own life, forget about searching for ways to make yourself look good. Instead, search for ways to make others look good. Ask, what positive, encouraging thing can I say to each person I will see today? Do it. Give everyone you meet the triple A treatment, attention, affirmation, and appreciation. Remember, within the first 30 seconds of a conversation, say something encouraging. Chapter 3. Let People Know You Need Them Less. One day I asked John the secret to getting people to join a team, and he told me it could be found in a single sentence, I can't do it without you. He went on to say that great leaders stumble when they believe people need them instead of recognizing that the very opposite is true. Leaders can become great, said John, only when they realize that they are the ones who need people. John, the day I realized I could no longer do everything myself was a major step in my development as a person and as a leader. I've always had vision, plenty of ideas, and vast amounts of energy. But when the vision gets bigger than you, you really only have two choices, give up on the vision or get help. I chose the latter. No matter how successful you are, no matter how important or accomplished, you do need people. That's why you need to let them know that you cannot win without them. President Woodrow Wilson said, We should not only use all the brains we have, but all that we can borrow. Why stop with just their brains? Enlist people's hands and hearts, too. Have you ever stopped to ask someone for directions? You roll down your car window and ask a passerby, Can you tell me how to find Larry's Market? Nearly every time people stop whatever they're doing and help if they can, even if it means crossing the street or standing in traffic. They may even repeat the directions a couple of times to make sure you get it. Why? Because whenever a person feels that he or she knows something you don't, it gives that person an ego boost. Everyone likes to be an expert, even if it's just for a moment. It gives them a great sense of superiority and of accomplishment when they help. That translates into an increased sense of self-worth, and it all stems from the universal need to be needed. People need to know they need people. It marks a big step in your development when you come to realize that other people can help you do a better job than you could do alone, said steel magnate and philanthropist Andrew Carnegie. Sadly, many people never achieve that level of maturity or insight. Some people still want to believe that they can achieve greatness alone. We all need people, and if we don't know it, we're in trouble. People need to know they are needed. Every human being longs for a life of significance. We all need to know we are needed and that what we offer to others is of value. People need to know that they helped. Whenever someone tells how valuable the people on my team are to them, I encourage them to tell the individuals who were so helpful. Why? Because people need to know that they helped someone. Good leaders make people feel that they're at the very heart of things, not at the periphery, says author and leadership expert Warren Bennis. Everyone feels that he or she makes a difference to the success of the organization. When that happens, people feel centered, and that gives their work meaning. It's not a sign of weakness to let others know you value them. It's a sign of security and strength. When you're honest about your need for help, specific with others about the value they add, and inclusive of others as you build a team to do something bigger than you are, everybody wins. To apply John's teaching to your own life, forget about a prideful attitude that causes you to prove how capable you are without the help of others. Ask, 
Who specifically can help me do a better job than I can do alone? Who is just waiting to be asked to join in what I am doing? Do it. Sincerely ask others for input or help and attend carefully to what they have to say. Remember, individuals who win with people make others feel that they are at the very heart of things, not at the periphery. Chapter 4. Create a Memory and Visit It Often Less One day when John was scheduled to speak to 3,000 young leaders in Phoenix at an event, as he stepped onto the platform, he realized his host had something different in mind. He didn't want me to speak at all, John explained. The group that was gathered had been reading his books and listening to his tapes through the years and had planned a surprise. Instead of having John speak to them, they wanted to speak to John. So they had him sit on the platform and simply listen as they honored him. One after another, twelve pre-selected leaders from the audience came up to the podium to tell the group about how John's teaching had made an impact on his or her life. It was completely unexpected, John said, and not only did they shower me with kind words, but each speaker presented me with a memento, a tangible remembrance of something they said they had learned from me. I was completely overwhelmed by the experience. One person gave John a beautiful painting with two images, one of a child reading one of John's books, and another of the child as a grown man coaching others. Less, John said, tears in his eyes and his voice cracking, I don't know how many times I've reminisced about that day. I keep the mementos around my office to relive it. That experience meant so much to me, and it renewed my desire to create memories for others. John Few things bond people together like a shared memory. Soldiers who battle together, teammates who win a championship, and work teams that hit their goals and share a connection that never goes away. Married couples who experience rough times can often look back on their earlier experiences together to keep them going. Families bond when they rough it on camping trips or share adventures on vacation and then love recounting their experience years later. Some memories come as the result of circumstance, but many can be proactively created. The richest memories are often those we plan and intentionally create. Here are some hints for creating memories that will help you win with people. 1. Make something happen. Memories don't find us, we find them. Even better, if we are intentional, we can make memories. If you mention the word chariot to friends Dan and Patty Reland or Tim and Pam Elmore, I can tell you exactly what will come to mind. A crisp autumn day in New York City when we did something that still makes us laugh. After lunch at Tavern on the Green, I hired three bicycle chariots with pedaling drivers to take each couple on a race through Manhattan to Macy's. It was up to each couple to motivate their driver to win, using whatever financial incentives they wanted. The race was neck and neck the entire way, and we laughed the whole time. We still laugh when we think about it or look at the photos we took that day, but it never would have happened if we hadn't initiated it. 2. Set aside time to make something happen. For years, parents have debated the issue of quality time versus quantity of time, and as a father and grandfather, I have discovered that it takes quantity time to find quality time. If you don't carve out the time, you can't create the memory. Haven't you found that most memories you have are with the people you spend the most time with? I know that's true for me. If you want to make memories with your family, spend more time with them. If you want to create memories with your employees, you won't do it behind the door of your office. You simply can't make memories with people if you don't take time to be with them. 3. Plan for something to happen. Most people don't lead their lives, they accept their lives. They wait for memorable experiences to happen, never giving a thought to planning an experience that will make a memory. One of the most extravagant memories I ever planned was with Margaret, my wife, for our 25th wedding anniversary. We decided to share it with 30 of our closest friends. We chartered a yacht and picked up everyone in San Diego Bay. Once on board, we had a delectable meal and then surprised the group by having Frankie Valens entertain us with some of his trademark songs like Sixteen Candles. Our friends loved it. But the most memorable highlight of the evening was created when Margaret and I said a few words about each person and why that person held such a special place in our hearts. 
That night is not only a great memory for Margaret and me, but it is a great memory for the people who attended too. 4. Find a way to make something happen. What do you do when you find yourself at an event where you expect to share a memory, but nothing seems to happen? You get creative. I've been asked over and over to tell the story of the Holiday Bowl I attended in San Diego with friends about 15 years ago. The game was so dull that I ended up buying newspapers for everyone in my section so that we would have something to do. Another guy nearby, not to be outdone, bought 100 bags of peanuts and distributed them to everybody in the section. The two of us got a standing ovation, and soon the news crews were more focused on us than the game. I don't remember the score or much about the game, but it's a night I'll never forget. Neither will the buddies who went with me. 5. Show that something happened. Almost anything you do today will be forgotten in just a few weeks, says John McCrone. The ability to retrieve a memory decreases exponentially unless boosted by artificial aids such as diaries and photographs. Don't you find that to be true? Do you keep pictures or souvenirs in your desk where you can see them? Do you carry photos of people you love in your wallet? Do you have a trophy, plaque, game ball, or other award on a shelf where you and others can see it? We all have things we love, not because they have any material value, but because they remind us of places we've been or things we've done. When you help someone else create a memory, give that person something to remember it by. That's great advice. Six, relive the memory. Talk about what happened. The most important part of creating a memory is reliving it. It's the payoff. Many times when I travel with others at the end of our trip, I ask them to share a favorite memory. It often leads to rich conversations. Or, I write a note to someone soon after to share my own favorite memory. It creates a connection that bonds us together and makes both of us feel great. To apply John's teaching to your own life, forget about trying to have quality time to make a memory if you aren't willing to invest the quantity of time it requires. Ask, what memories have I already created with people in my life that we need to relive together? Do it. Plan an experience that will commemorate an achievement or milestone that people will talk about years from now, and don't forget to create a memento of it. Remember, we shouldn't wait for memories to happen to us. We need to make memories happen. Chapter 5. Compliment People in Front of Other People John The most fundamental and straightforward way of winning with people is to give them a compliment, a sincere and meaningful word of affirmation. If you want to make others feel like a million bucks, you've got to master this elementary skill. And it's essential that you learn to give your compliments in front of others as well as one-on-one. Why? Because that private compliment turned public instantly and dramatically increases in value. Here are reasons why that's so important. For one, people want to feel worthwhile in life. Everyone has an invisible sign hanging from his neck, says Mary Kay Ash. It says, make me feel important. Mary Kay drilled this principle into her sales team. She told them again and again, never forget this message when working with people. She knew compliments and affirmation were critical to enjoying success with others. And by the way, it's one of the reasons she was so successful. With her life savings of $5,000 and the help of her then 20-year-old son, she launched Mary Kay Cosmetics in 1963. The company now has more than 500,000 independent beauty consultants in 29 markets worldwide, and Mary Kay Inc. is ranked as one of the 100 best companies to work for in America. Mary Kay, like every other person who wins with people, knew that people want to feel worthwhile, and when you continually keep this in mind, you can't help but give compliments freely. Secondly, compliments affirm people and make them strong. To affirm is to make firm, and affirmation is a statement of truth you make firm in a person's heart when you utter it. As a result, it cultivates conviction. For example, When you compliment a person's attitude, you reinforce it and make it more consistent. Because you notice it in a positive way, he will be more likely to demonstrate that same attitude again. Likewise, when you affirm people's dreams, you help their dreams become more real than their doubts. 
Like the repetition of a weightlifting regimen, routine compliments build up people's qualities and strengthen their personalities. And thirdly, compliments in front of others are the most effective ones you can give. As commander of a $1 billion warship and a crew of 310, Mike Abrashoff used grassroots leadership to increase retention rates from 28% to 100%, reduce operating expenditures, and improve readiness. How did he do it? Among other things, he placed supreme importance on public compliments. The commanding officer of a ship is authorized to hand out 15 medals a year, he wrote. I want to err on the side of excess, so I passed out 115. Nearly every time a sailor left his ship for another assignment, Captain Abrashoff gave him or her a medal. Even if they hadn't been star players, they got medals in a public ceremony as long as they had done their best every day. I delivered a short speech describing how much we cherished the recipient's friendship, camaraderie, and hard work. Sometimes the departing sailor's shipmates told funny stories, recalling his or her foibles, trials, and triumphs. But the bottom line was that Abrashoff wanted to make them feel good by complimenting them in front of others. There is absolutely no downside to this symbolic gesture, said Abrashoff, provided it is done sincerely without hype. Captain D. Michael Abrashoff knew how to make his sailors feel like a million bucks. You can do the same thing for the people around you. Whenever you have the opportunity to publicly praise another person, don't let it slip by. Of course, you can create these opportunities, as Captain Abrashoff did, but you can also find countless opportunities if you just look for them. To apply John's teaching to your own life, forget about giving compliments only in private. Instead, give public praise whenever you can. Ask, who can I spotlight in front of others? Do it. Compliment someone around you in front of other people today. Remember, when you give someone a public compliment, you give him or her wings like an eagle. Chapter 6. Give Others a Reputation to Uphold Less Winston Churchill is one of John's leadership heroes. He told me once of how the Prime Minister helped to uplift millions of his countrymen in the wake of Britain's June 1940 defeat at the Battle of Dunkirk. John quoted part of the speech Churchill used to address the House of Commons upon that occasion. We shall not flag or fail. We shall fight in France. We shall fight in the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. John explained, Churchill did a lot of remarkable things during the war, but one of the greatest was his continual ability to give the English people a reputation to uphold. He inspired them, he motivated them, he challenged them, and in response, they rose to the occasion. They loved him for it. John has tried to embody this quality. He says that as he interacts with others, he constantly asks himself, what is special, unique, and wonderful about this individual? Then he shares it with others. I've seen John do this time after time. John thinks the best of people and speaks about the fine qualities he sees in them. John, one of the best ways to inspire others and make them feel good about themselves is to show them who they could be. Years ago, a manager for the New York Yankees wanted rookie players to know what a privilege it was to play for the team. He used to tell them, boys, it's an honor just to put on the New York pinstripes. So when you put them on, play like world champions, play like Yankees, play proud. When you give someone a reputation to uphold, you give him something good to shoot for. It's putting something that was beyond his reach within his grasp. By speaking to their potential, you help people around you to play proud, as the Yankees do. Why is that important? because people will go farther than they thought they could go when someone they respect tells them they can. If you desire to give others a reputation to uphold, here are suggestions on how to get started. First, have a high opinion of people. 
The opinions you have of people in your life affect them profoundly. Dr. J. Sterling Livingston, formerly of the Harvard Business School and founder of the Sterling Institute Management Consulting Firm, observed, People perform consistently as they perceive you expect them to perform. A reputation is something that many people spend their entire lives trying to live down or live up to. So why not help others up instead of pushing them down? All people possess both value and potential. You can find those things if you try. Second, back up your high opinions of others with action. When you back up your beliefs in people with action, their self-doubt begins to evaporate. It's one thing to tell your teenager that you believe he's a good driver. It's another to let him have the keys to your car for the evening. Likewise, if you want a new manager to rise to the high opinion you've expressed about her, then give her significant responsibility. Nothing gives people confidence like seeing someone they respect put his money where his mouth is. Not only does it empower them emotionally, but it also resources their drive towards success. Third, look past their pasts and give them reputations for their futures. Old negative names, labels, or nicknames can block a person's growth and progress. Perhaps that's why the rites of passage in many cultures include giving a new title or name to the person being honored. A new name gives someone a hope for a new future. A fun example of this can be found in the movie and play The Man of La Mancha, based on Cervantes' classic work Don Quixote. The protagonist, Don Alonso, pursues a life of chivalry and seeks to become a knight-errant long after that age of history has passed. He sees giants where others see windmills and quests where others see rabbit trails. Comically, he rescues a common prostitute named Aldanza, whom he sees as a beautiful lady. He calls her Dulcinea and makes her the object of his knightly exploits. At first, she resents him. She thinks he is mocking her because she hates herself and her life. But with time, his vision of her replaces her own and gives her hope. And as the old man lies on his deathbed, she thanks him for seeing in her what she could not see in herself. Of course, the most dramatic examples of someone overlooking the pasts of others and giving them reputations for their future can be found in the Bible. In the book of Genesis, God changes the life of Abram, an old man with no offspring, when he renames him Abraham, which means father of many. Abraham did indeed go on to become a father in his old age. And God takes Jacob, a trickster who cheats his brother, lies to his father, and constantly schemes to get ahead, and he renames him Israel, his future becoming the inception of the nation Israel. And four, give people a new name or nickname that speaks to their potential. Harry Hopman, one of the finest tennis captains and coaches in Australia's history and a member of the International Tennis Hall of Fame, at one time built the Australian team to the point that it dominated the tennis world. How did he do it? by emphasizing what he called coaching by affirmation. For example, he had a slow player whom he nicknamed Rocket. Another player who was not known for his strength or constitution he called Muscles. And it certainly gave them a boost. Rocket Rod Laver and Ken Muscles Rosewall became champions in the tennis world. Everyone enjoys the encouragement that comes from someone seeing and speaking to their potential. To apply John's teaching to your own life, forget about a person's failures in the past and focus on his or her potential in the future. Ask, what is special, unique, and wonderful about this person? How can I show it to others? Do it. Back up your high opinion of a person with action that reinforces that opinion. Remember, many people go farther than they thought they could go because someone else believed they could and told them so. Chapter 7. Say the Right Words at the Right Time Less. Ask nearly anyone who knows John well, and he will tell you a story of a specific time when John said the right words to him at the right time. One of the most touching I heard while working on this book came from Dan Ryland, John's close friend and former right-hand man. John has done this so often in my life, explained Dan, but the time that stands out above all the others is when my mother died. 
Her death was sudden and unexpected. Dan promptly got word to John, who was out of town at the time. John and Margaret quickly changed their plans and flew back home to San Diego. Dan recalled, John and Margaret came in the door of our house in Rancho San Diego, walked right up to me, gave me a big hug, and said, I love you. That was it. There's nothing anyone could have done that would have been better. People who have not been around John up close and personal are sometimes surprised to find out how good he is at saying the right words at the right time. They're used to his public persona as a speaker, where he also excels at communication and timing. But what they may not realize is that John is a genuine encourager who loves to help people and who really understands them both on and off stage. The right words at the right time are like a soothing breeze of encouragement. John. Most people recognize that words have incredible power, but saying the right words is not enough. Timing is crucial. Sometimes the best thing we can do for someone else is to hold our tongue. When tempted to give advice that's not wanted, to show off, to say, I told you so, or to point out another's error, the best policy is to say nothing. As 19th century British journalist George Sala advised, we should strive not only to say the right thing in the right place, but far more difficult to leave unsaid the wrong thing at the tempting moment. When is it time to speak up? How can you best encourage others using the right words at the right time? Keep these thoughts in mind. First, be sensitive to time and place. It's said that during one of the last major offenses of World War II, General Dwight Eisenhower was walking near the Rhine and came upon a G.I. who seemed depressed. How are you feeling, son? he asked. General, the young man replied, I'm awful nervous. Well, Eisenhower said, you and I are a good pair then because I'm nervous too. Maybe if we just walk along together, we'll be good for each other. The first key to saying the right thing at the right time is paying attention to the context. That is one of the secrets of successful communication to a large audience, and it is just as important when talking with someone one-on-one. -on -one. King Solomon of ancient Israel was speaking to this truth when he wrote, Like apples of gold and settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstances. If you can learn to be sensitive to your setting, you've won half the battle in saying the right words at the right time. Secondly, say it from the heart. It's not just what you say and when you say it, it's also how you say it. A Peanuts comic strip shows Lucy saying to pianist Schroeder, Do you think I'm the most beautiful girl in the world? Naturally, she has to ask several times in different ways until Schroeder, to be finally rid of her, says, Yes. Lucy mopes disconsolately and comments, even when he says it, he doesn't say it. People can tell the difference between hollow words and something that is said from the heart. Saying the right words at the right time can do more than just make a person feel good in the moment. It can have an impact that is positive and lasting. Painter Benjamin West said that he loved to paint as a youngster. When his mother left the house, he would get out the oils and try to paint. One day when he pulled out paints, brushes, paper, and various other implements, he made quite a mess. When he realized his mother would be home soon, he tried desperately to get everything cleaned up, but he didn't make it. When she walked into the room, he expected the worst. West said that what she did next completely surprised him. She picked up his painting, looked at it, and said, My, what a beautiful painting of your sister. She gave him a kiss on the cheek and walked away. With that kiss, West said, he became a painter. I don't know what kind of experience you had growing up. Perhaps, like me, you had parents who understood the power of encouragement. If not, what would you have given to have someone speak into your life at the right time, a parent, teacher, coach, or pastor? Whether or not you received it then, you can give it now. Look for opportunities to uplift others with your words. It just might change their lives. To apply this teaching in your own life, forget about what you want to say and focus on what the other person needs to hear. Ask, what would I want to hear if I was in this person's shoes? Do it. Change someone's day or maybe even his entire life by saying the right words at the right time from the heart. Remember, 
like apples of gold and settings of silver, is a word spoken in the right circumstances. Chapter 8. Encourage the Dreams of Others John I consider it a great privilege when people share their dreams with me. It shows me a great deal of courage and trust. And at that moment, I'm conscious that I have great power in their lives. That's no small matter. A wrong word can crush a person's dream. The right word can inspire him or her to pursue it. If someone thinks enough of you to tell you about his or her dreams, take care. Actress Candace Bergen commented, Dreams are, by definition, cursed with short lifespans. I suspect she said that because there are people who don't like to see others pursuing their dreams. It reminds them of how far they are from living their own dreams. As a result, they try to knock down anyone who is shooting for the stars. By talking others out of their dreams, critical people excuse themselves for staying in their comfort zones. Never allow yourself to become a dream killer. Instead, become a dream releaser. Even if you think another person's dream is far-fetched, that's no excuse for criticizing them. Have you given up on one of your dreams? Have you buried a hope that once looked bright and gave you energy? If so, what did it do to you? Norman Cousins, former editor of the Saturday Review and adjunct professor of psychiatry at UCLA, believed, Death is not the greatest loss in life. The greatest loss is what dies inside of us while we live. Because dreams are at the center of our souls, we must do everything in our power to help turn dreams into reality. That is one of the greatest gifts we can ever give. How can you do it? Follow these six steps. 1. Ask them to share their dream with you. Everyone has a dream, but few people are asked about it. 2. Affirm the person as well as the dream. Let the person know that you not only value his or her dream, but that you also recognize traits in that individual that can help him or her achieve it. 3. Ask about the challenges they must overcome to reach their dream. Few people ask others about their dreams. Even fewer try to find out what kinds of hurdles the person is up against to pursue them. 4. Offer your assistance. No one achieves a worthwhile dream alone. You will be amazed by how people light up when you offer to help them achieve their dream. 5. Revisit their dream with them on a consistent basis. If you really want to help others with their dreams, don't make it a one-time activity you mark off your list. Check in with them to see how they're doing and to lend assistance. 6. Determine daily to be a dream booster, not a dream buster. Everyone has a dream and everyone needs encouragement. Set your mental radar to pick up on others' dreams and help them along. There is no telling what might happen if you were to begin encouraging the dreams of the people around you. When you come to the end of your life, wouldn't you love to be the person about whom others say, I succeeded because this person believed in me when nobody else did? Start encouraging others. The more you do, the more they will share their dreams with you, and the greater chance you will get to watch them bloom. To apply John's teaching to your own life, forget about critiquing another person's dream. Instead, affirm his lofty vision and his pursuit to realize it. Ask, who can I encourage today in reaching their dreams? Do it. Offer specific help in bringing another person closer to making his or her dream a reality. Remember, when a person shares his or her dream with you, it's at the center of that person's soul. Chapter 9. Pass the Credit on to Others. Less. Some time ago, John and I were both speaking at a conference in Virginia, and between sessions I asked him to pinpoint a publishing highlight in his career. That's a tough one, Les, he told me. I've been blessed in ways I could have never anticipated. Surely something stands out, I gently pressed. Well, when the 21 Laws of Leadership sold one million copies, Thomas Nelson, the publishing house, hosted a celebration banquet for about 120 people from their company and Enjoy to mark the occasion. They gave me some beautiful gifts that night, including these. John pulled up the sleeve of his jacket and pointed to the gold cufflinks he was wearing, each one bearing the number 21. 
What an honor that evening was. Sometime later, I spoke to a few of the people who attended that banquet. One of them said that when John got up to address everyone, John expressed his gratitude and quickly started crediting the people who had helped make it happen. He told how Victor Oliver had come up with the original concept for the book and had provided the title. He credited a group of key leaders at Enjoy who had helped him hone the laws. He thanked Charlie Wetzel, his writer, for being the book's wordsmith. He thanked Ron Land of Thomas Nelson and Enjoy's Kevin Small and his team for putting together the book tour that helped put the 21 laws on the New York Times bestseller list. He thanked publisher Mike Hyatt, the Nelson sales and marketing staff, the booksellers, and many other individuals, including his parents. By the time John finished, there wasn't a dry eye in the room. John, I'll never forget that night in Orlando. When I wrote my first book in 1979, I never dreamed that anything I wrote would sell a million copies. As Margaret and I went back to our hotel room, she asked me what I considered to be the highlight of the banquet. Without hesitation, I replied that it was passing on the credit to the people who had helped me so much. Rarely do we get an opportunity to say thank you enough to the people who help us, especially in such a public setting. I really wanted to make the most of it. Not only does it make me feel good to share my success I might have, but it uplifts others and makes them feel like a million bucks. Passing the credit on to others is one of the easiest ways to win with people. If you'd like to practice it, here are a few suggestions to get you started. 1. Check your ego at the door. The number one reason people don't pass along credit to others is that they think it will somehow take away from them. Many people are so insecure that they constantly feed their egos to compensate for it. But you simply cannot practice this method of winning with people if you can't set your ego aside. Have you ever heard the saying, an egotist is not a person who thinks too much of himself, it's someone who thinks too little of other people. If you want to give others credit, put your focus on others. What do they need? How will giving them credit make them feel? How will it enhance their performance? How will it motivate them to reach their potential? If you highlight their contributions, it makes them and you look good. Second, don't wait. Pass the credit ASAP. I love what H. Ross Perot once said about passing on credit. Reward employees while the sweat's still on their brow. Isn't it true that one of the very best times to give credit to others is when the amount of work and sacrifice something took is still fresh in their minds? Why wait? You may have heard management expert Ken Blanchard's teaching that you should catch people while they're doing something good. What a great idea. The sooner you give credit to someone else, the bigger the payoff. In 2003, when I interviewed UCLA basketball coach John Wooden, He told me how he would often teach his players who scored to give a smile, wink, or nod to the player who gave them a good pass. What if he's not looking, asked a team member. Wooden replied, I guarantee he'll look. Everyone enjoys having his contribution acknowledged. Third, say it in front of others. When you give credit to others in front of their peers and loved ones, the value of your compliment multiplies. Four, put it in print. When you give people credit verbally, you uplift them for a moment. When you take the time to put it in writing, you have the potential to uplift them for a lifetime. People put plaques on their walls as reminders of their achievements. They save and cherish letters containing recognition and praise for things they've done. Deep down, everyone wants to make a difference, and some days, everyone is in need of some encouragement. I have a file in my office with letters and notes that have special significance for me. Every now and then I'll pull out the file and read some of the things people I respect have told me. It allows me to relive that moment of encouragement. It's said that even President Abraham Lincoln used to carry in his pocket a newspaper clipping extolling his accomplishments as president. He was one of the finest leaders in our nation's history, yet he desired something to keep his spirits up. Please don't underestimate the impact that an article, a public notice, or a personal note can make. What takes you only a few minutes to write may be something that inspires another person for decades. And finally, only say it if you mean it. It may seem obvious, but I want to go ahead and say it anyway so I'm not misunderstood. 
You should never say something you don't believe just to uplift someone. If you're not sincere, you don't make people feel good. You make them feel like they're being schmoozed. When you pass credit on to others, you need to do it from the heart. To apply John's teaching to your own life, forget about your ego. Focus on the people around you and the credit they deserve. Ask, who has made me more successful than I would have been on my own? Do it. Publicly pass along credit for a successful endeavor to as many people as you can. Remember, if each of us were to confess our most secret desire, we would say, I want to be praised. Chapter 10, Offer Your Very Best John For years I've been invited to be the keynote speaker for organizations at their special events. It's something I really enjoy. Communicating to an audience energizes me. It would be easy for me to wing it and do a canned speech that I've done elsewhere before, but I never do that because I don't believe it would serve them well. Instead, I spend time researching the company. I find out as much as I can about the particular event they've planned and what they desire to accomplish. Why would I do such work when I wouldn't need to in order to be successful? Because I have a goal every time I speak. After I'm done communicating with the audience, I want the person who invited me to speak at the event to say, You exceeded our expectations. I want to deliver for them, and then some. Perhaps you are someone who already possesses an offer-your-best mindset. If so, I commend you, and I want to encourage you to maintain that attitude. If not, I hope the following thoughts will help you develop that mindset. We are most likely to give our best to those we love and respect. I think back to my days in school, and I remember loving some teachers and having others who left me cold. I know that I always did my best for the teachers I liked, and for the others I did only what was needed to get a grade. Later, I realized that my off-and-on efforts frequently hurt my relationships with others as well as my potential for success. But then I discovered the antidote. If I saw everyone as important, not just the people I liked the most, I would always offer my best. That change in attitude prompted a change in my actions. Most moments in life become special only if we treat them that way. The average day is average only because we don't make it something more. The most excellent way to elevate an experience is to give it our best. That makes it special. An average conversation becomes something better when you listen with great interest. A common relationship transforms when you give it uncommon effort. An unremarkable event becomes something special when you spice it up with creativity. You can make anything more important by giving your best to it. More than 30 years ago, I memorized a quote that has shaped the way I live. My potential is God's gift to me. What I do with my potential is my gift to Him. I believe I am accountable to God, others, and myself for every gift, talent, resource, and opportunity I have in life. If I give less than my best, then I am shirking my responsibility. I believe UCLA coach John Wooden was speaking to this idea when he said, Make every day your masterpiece. If we give our best all the time, we can make our lives into something special, and that will overflow into the lives of others. There's a story I love about President Dwight Eisenhower. He once told the National Press Club that he regretted not having a better political background so that he would be a better orator. He said his lack of skill in that area reminded him of his boyhood days in Kansas when an old farmer had a cow for sale. The buyer asked the farmer about the cow's pedigree, butterfat production, and monthly production of milk. The farmer said, I don't know what a pedigree is and I don't have any idea about butterfat production, but she's a good cow, and she'll give you all the milk she has. That's all any of us can do. Give all that we have. That's always enough. To apply John's teaching to your own life, forget about doing the minimum required to get by, and focus instead on your maximum effort. Ask, what can I do for someone who could never repay me? Do it voluntarily give beyond what is required. Remember, 
everyone appreciates a person who gives his very best. Chapter 11 Share a Secret with Someone John A Sicilian proverb says, Only the spoon knows what is stirring in the pot. When you allow another person to know what is stirring within you, giving them a taste of a plan or idea, you instantly make a meaningful connection with them. Who doesn't want to know what's going on in the mind of someone they care about? You can make sharing a secret part of your everyday life using everyday things. The first time you share something with others, aren't you sharing something that has been secret up to that moment? Why not let the person to whom you're talking know that you're revealing it for the first time? That makes him feel special. Sharing a secret with someone is really a matter of two things, reading the context of a situation and desiring to build up the other person. If you do those two things, you can learn this skill. As you try it out, keep these three things in mind. 1. Sharing a secret means giving valuable information. When you share a secret, the information needs to be something that the people you're talking to care about. It plays to their interests or meets a felt need they possess. For example, two experienced deep-sea fishermen decided to go ice fishing. They each chopped holes in the ice, put worms on their hooks, dropped their lines into the water, and waited. After three hours, they had caught nothing. As they sat, they watched a boy come along and cut a hole in the ice midway between them. He put a worm on his hook, dropped his line into the water, and almost instantly he caught a fish. The boy repeated the process and quickly had a catch of more than a dozen fish. The two other fishermen watched and were flabbergasted. Finally, one of the men approached the boy and said, Young man, we've been here for more than three hours and haven't caught a single fish. You've caught at least a dozen in just a few minutes. What's your secret? The boy mumbled an answer, but the man didn't catch a word of it. Then he noticed a large bulge in the boy's left cheek. Please, could you take the bubble gum out of your mouth so I can understand what you're saying, the man said. The boy cupped his hands, spat it out, and said, It's not bubble gum. It's my secret. You've got to keep the worms warm. 2. Sharing a secret makes people feel special. Letting people in on something always boosts their egos. But the secret doesn't always have to be dramatic to have a positive effect. For example, when I play golf, I usually carry a laminated card with me that contains tips given to me by golf pro Scott Simoniak. Occasionally, if a friend in the group is not playing well, I'll pull him aside and say, I want to share a secret with you that has really helped my golf game. Then I'll pull out the card and show him the six basic things a golfer must know and do. And I'll let him know that it's my personal golf plan and that I don't share it with everybody. How does it make you feel when you know that you're the first person being told something? I know it makes me feel special. That's one of the reasons my wife Margaret and I practice telling each other first about many of the things that happen to us during the day. To help me do that, I carry a note card or a small pad and jot things down I want to tell her. Anything I write down, I save to tell her first. It leads to special times together every day. 3. Sharing a secret includes others in your journey. The bottom line on sharing a secret with others is that it is an act of inclusion. It invites others into your life, into your experience. It includes them in your success. When I speak to an audience, whether it's a round table of executives or an arena full of people, I intentionally use inclusive language. I let people in on my personal journey. And when I'm revealing something I've not previously said publicly, I let them know that I'm doing so. It communicates to people that I care about them and want to help them. When you share a secret with others, you are doing far more than imparting mere information. You are increasing the odds of a closer relationship. To apply John's teaching to your own life, forget about hoarding information for yourself. Ask. Whom can I benefit most by letting them in on some otherwise private information? Do it. Find someone to let in on a secret today. Remember, sharing a secret with someone is bound to boost their self-esteem. Chapter 12. Mine the Gold of Good Intentions. Less. 
Do you ever struggle to give people the benefit of the doubt, to mine the gold of their good intentions? I know I do, especially when I think they've dropped the ball or tried to hurt me. But if you're like me, you also know that this tendency can be a costly interpersonal mistake if you want to win with people. So when I confessed this faux pas to John one day, he immediately identified with what I said. But he also told me how he had learned to give people the benefit of the doubt. He watched his mother. Mom knew my heart, and she always evaluated my behavior in light of it, John explained. Today when I say to someone, I didn't mean to do that, I often wish that they would mine the gold of my good intentions, like my mom did. Her ability and willingness to do this in my life was a tremendous gift, and it's helped me to give the benefit of the doubt to others. Are you saying your mom looked past all your mistakes, I asked. John laughed, definitely not. Like every other kid, I got my fair share of reprimands, and trust me, I deserved them. But Mom never seemed to jump to conclusions with me. She never assumed the worst. Instead, she always assumed the best. And that's the key to cultivating this quality. You see, John continued, it did many things for me. He counted them off. It allowed me to draw close to her. It made her approachable. It brought out the best in me, and it taught me how to do this for others. Okay, John, I asked as I consider his words, do you think that a person who wasn't raised in a home where this kind of quality was modeled is going to have a tougher time doing this for others? Less, I don't really think so, he said. Sure, a person whose home life wasn't positive won't have seen it modeled, so that person may not do it naturally. But when it comes right down to it, Giving others the benefit of the doubt is a choice, and I've seen a lot of people who grew up with few advantages rise above that and become winners in every sense of the word. That gives everyone hope. John First, let's start by being honest. Not everyone has pure intentions. Occasionally, people will take advantage of you. They have in my life, and they will in the future. But because I assume the best in others, so many people have done so many wonderful things for me that I literally cannot count them all. I've found that when I'm suspicious of others, it causes me to display wrong behavior toward them, and it actually makes any interaction with them worse. In general, you get what you expect from others. So I've chosen to take the high road, expect the best, and be blessed most of the time. If you desire to do the same, then the first thing you need to do is check your attitude. How do you see others? Do you believe that deep down every person desires to be good, to do his best? That matters because if you don't believe the best in others, you will never believe that their intentions are good. And if you don't believe in their intentions, I imagine you will not exert the effort to mine the gold that is in them. Second, you need to see things from their perspective. The issue of perspective really has to do with maturity. Without maturity, we lack perspective. The less mature one is, the more difficult it is to see things from another's point of view. Think about the biblical story of the woman caught in adultery, where Jesus challenged the people without sin to cast the first stone. The oldest people in the crowd were the first to drop their stones and walk away. Why? Their maturity gave them better perspective. Third, give people the benefit of the doubt. When you were a child, perhaps you were taught the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I've often found that when my intentions were right but my action turned out wrong, I wanted others to see me in light of the golden rule. In other words, I wanted others to give me the benefit of the doubt. Why shouldn't I try to extend the same courtesy to others? What great relationships we would have if everybody was appreciated for what they intended to do in spite of what they may have done. When you give someone the benefit of the doubt, you are following the most effective interpersonal rule that has ever been written. We all have good days and bad days. I don't know about you, but I'd like to be remembered for my good ones, and I can only ask to be forgiven for my bad ones. Fuller Theological Seminary professor David Augsburger says, since nothing we intend is ever faultless, and nothing we achieve without some measure of finitude and fallibility we call humanness, we are saved by forgiveness. If you desire to mine the gold of good intentions in others, then forgiveness is essential. And it's rarely a one-time thing. Civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. was right when he said, 
Forgiveness is not an occasional act. It is a permanent attitude. And remember, it is with the attitude with which you judge others that you will also be judged. If you mine the gold of good intentions in your relationship with others, then people will more likely do the same for you. To apply John's teaching to your own life, forget about justice. Instead, focus on grace and forgiveness. Ask, how would I feel and what would I do if I were in this person's shoes? Do it. Practice the golden rule by appreciating what others intend, not only what they do, just as you would like for them to do with you. Remember, if I fail to believe in the best of others, I will not give the effort to mine the gold contained in them. Chapter 13 Keep your eyes off the mirror. John The entire population of the world, with one minor exception, is composed of other people. If you've never thought of life in those terms, then it's time to give it a try. If individuals think they are the center of the universe, not only are they in for a big disappointment when they discover it's not true, but they'll also alienate themselves from everyone around them. I've never met a person that truly wins with other people who has not mastered the ability to keep his eyes off the mirror and serve others with dignity. Most people would readily admit that unselfishness is a positive quality and even the most egocentric individual possesses the desire deep down to help others. The problem sometimes is changing our behavior so that we get in the habit of focusing on others instead of on ourselves. Here are a few thoughts to help you remember to keep your eyes off the mirror. If you grew up in the 1950s and 60s, you may remember Danny Thomas, the entertainer who starred in the TV show Make Room for Daddy. Thomas observed, All of us are born for a reason, but all of us don't discover why. Success in life has nothing to do with what you gain in life or accomplish for yourself. It's what you do for others. Not only did Thomas believe that, but he also lived it. As a successful entertainer and television star, he could have done nothing but enjoy the benefits of his achievement. But he desired something more. He founded St. Jude's Hospital, a research facility that focuses on treating children who suffer from catastrophic diseases. And Thomas dedicated much of his life to supporting it. It helped him enjoy a greater purpose. Continual focus on yourself can actually drain you of energy, while focusing on others can have the opposite effect. My friend Bill McCartney knew this back when he was head football coach for the University of Colorado Buffaloes. Coach Mack had heard that most people spend 86% of their time thinking about themselves, but only 14% of their time thinking about others. Yet he knew instinctively that if his players focused their attention on someone they cared about instead of just on themselves a whole new source of energy would be available to them. In 1991, Coach Mack decided to use this information when he was facing a great challenge. Colorado was scheduled to play its arch rival, the Nebraska Cornhuskers, on Nebraska's home turf. The problem was that Colorado had not won a game there in 23 years. But Coach McCartney believed in his team and looked for a way to inspire them to achieve. In the end, he decided to appeal to their love of others. He did it by challenging each player to call an individual he loved and tell that person he was dedicating the game to him or her. Coach Mack also encouraged the players to ask that person to watch every play, knowing that every hit, every tackle, every block, and every score was being dedicated to him or her. Coach Mack also took one more step. He arranged to distribute 60 footballs with the game's final score written on them so that each player could send a ball to the individual he had chosen. The Colorado Buffaloes won the game. The final score written on the footballs was 27 to 12. I'm told that psychological research shows that people are better adjusted and more likely to feel content if they serve others. Serving others actually cultivates health and brings about happiness. You can actually help yourself by helping others. Remember that, and it will help you to take and keep your eyes off the mirror. To apply John's teaching to your own life, 
forget about trying to find happiness by tending to your own needs first. Ask, what can I do to forget myself and focus on others? Do it. Set your needs aside and do something specific today that will help you keep your eyes off the mirror. Remember, Success in life has everything to do with what you do for others. Chapter 14. Do for others what they can't do for themselves. John. Ambassador and poet Henry Van Dyke observed, There is a loftier ambition than merely to stand high in the world. It is to stoop down and lift mankind a little higher. What a great perspective. Doing for others what they can't do for themselves is really a matter of attitude. I believe that whatever I've been given is to be shared with others. And because I have an abundance mindset, I never worry about running out myself. The more I give away, the more I seem to get to give away. No matter how much or how little you think you have, you have the ability to do for others what they cannot do for themselves. Exactly how you do that will depend on your unique gifts, resources, and history. However, you can approach the task by thinking in terms of four areas. 1. Introduce others to people they can't know on their own. My dad, Melvin Maxwell, has done many incredible things for me during the course of my life. One of the things that impacted me most was his introducing me to great men. As a teenager, I met Norman Vincent Peale, E. Stanley Jones, and other great men of the faith. And because I had declared my intention to go into the ministry, my father asked these great preachers to pray for me. I can't express in words what that did for me. Today, I am often in a position to do for others what my father did for me. I love introducing young people to my heroes. I love helping people make business contacts. There are often times when I meet someone, and as we talk, it just hits me. I need to introduce this person to so-and-so. That can mean walking somebody across the room, making a phone call on his or her behalf, or arranging a meeting. Several years ago, I was talking to Ann Byler, the founder of Auntie Ann's Pretzels, and she mentioned in passing that Chick-fil-A's founder, Truett Cathy, was one of her heroes. Since I knew Truett, I offered to introduce them to each other. I hosted a dinner party for them at my house, and it was a great night. Please don't get the impression that you have to know someone famous to help others in this area. Sometimes it's as simple as introducing one friend to another or one business associate to another. Just make connections. Be the bridge in people's relationships with others. 2. Take others to places where they can't go on their own. It seems that during the first half of my career, if I got to go anywhere of value to me, it was because someone invited me. Dozens of times I've had experiences that I could not have gained access to on my own. I've gone to ball games, played golf courses, seen churches, attended conferences, and visited countries that appeared to be beyond my reach. You may have the power to give someone an experience that seems inaccessible to them. If you can't help a friend or colleague, then start with your own family. Take your children places they could not go on their own. There's no telling what kind of positive impact it will make. 3. Offer others opportunities they can't reach on their own. Nearly 25 years ago, Professor C. Peter Wagner of Fuller Seminary invited me to speak to audiences of pastors around the country about leadership. He put me on a national stage for the first time and gave me credibility that I didn't possess on my own. Few things are of greater value to a prepared person than an opportunity. Why? Because opportunities increase our potential. An opportunity seized is often a source of success. Help people win by giving them opportunities, and you will win with them. 4. Share ideas with others that they don't possess on their own. What is an idea worth? Every product begins with an idea. Every service begins with an idea. Every business, every book, every new invention begins with an idea. Ideas are what makes the world move forward. So when you give people an idea, you give them a great gift. One of the things I love about writing books is the process that it takes me through. It usually starts with a concept that I'm anxious to teach. I get a few ideas down on paper, and then I call together a group of good creative thinkers to help me test the concept, brainstorm ideas, and flesh out the outline. 
Every time we've done this, people have given me great ideas that I never would have come up with on my own. I have to say, I'm very grateful. One of the things I enjoy most about creative people is that they love ideas, and they always seem to have more coming. The more they give away, the more new ideas they seem to have. Creativity and generosity feed each other. That's one of the reasons I'm never reluctant to share ideas with others. I'm convinced that I will run out of time long before I run out of ideas. It's better to give some away and contribute to another person's success than to have them lying dormant in me. To apply John's teaching to your life, forget about focusing on what you can get from others and focus instead on what you can do for others. Ask, what opportunity, idea, or experience could I provide that someone might never have been able to have without my help? Do it. Consider specific things you might be able to do for others by making a list of your unique skills, resources, and connections. Remember, we all need others to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Chapter 15, Listen With Your Heart, Less As a psychologist, I've been trained to listen for people's feelings, not just their ideas. And I've observed that many leaders, especially strong ones with type A personalities, are not particularly good at listening. When they do listen, their attitude is usually, never mind the delivery story, just show me the baby. I would consider John to be a pretty strong person. He can be a take-charge, take-no-prisoners kind of leader. But he is also an effective listener. And he's particularly adept at sensing how people feel. Since that characteristic is unusual for most people like him, I ask him how he became such a good listener. Failure was his answer. Repeated failure. I started out as a terrible listener. Early in my career, I thought I knew it all. The only reason I let people talk was that I knew my turn to talk was coming. In my marriage, I was a little bit better, John continued. I very much wanted to listen to Margaret because of my love for her. However, that didn't stop me from being Mr. Answer Man. I used to win arguments but run over her emotionally. Finally, understanding how I was hurting her feelings caused me to stop what I was doing and learn how to listen not just to the words, but to the feelings behind her words. I learned to listen with my heart. So how did you make the transfer from home to your career, I asked. I saw the value in it from the way Margaret's and my relationship changed. But I also came to realize that it was good leadership, too. For a couple of years, whenever I was in a meeting, I wrote a large L at the top of my legal pad to remind myself to listen. In time, it became a skill I mastered. If you are already a good listener, you are ahead of the game. All you have to do is listen between the lines for cues that will tell you how others feel. If you're more like John, it may take you some time to learn the skill of listening with your heart. John, if you are a poor listener as I was, then do the following to transform yourself into someone who listens with the heart. First, focus on the person. Many people put their focus on the ideas being communicated, and they almost seem to forget about the person. You can't do that and listen with the heart. I am naturally very impatient, so I continually have to fight against the tendency to put my agenda first. I think that is often the case with poor listeners. If that is true for you, slow down and put the person first. Focus on the individual, not just the ideas being expressed. Secondly, unclog your ears. Even after you've begun to focus on the person with whom you are conversing, you may still experience many potential barriers to effective listening. Here are a few of them. Distractions. Phone calls, TV, pagers, and things of that sort can make good listening nearly impossible. Defensiveness. If you view complaints or criticism as a personal attack, you can become defensive. Once you begin to protect yourself, you will care little about what others think or how they feel. Close-mindedness. When you think you have all the answers, you close your mind. And when you close your mind, you close your ears. Projection. Automatically attributing your own thoughts and feelings to others prevents you from perceiving how they feel. Assumptions. When you jump to conclusions, 
you take away your own incentive to listen. Pride. Thinking we have little to learn from others is perhaps the most deadly of distractions to listening. Being full of yourself leaves little room for input from others. Obviously, your goal is to remove these barriers to good communication. Whenever possible, put yourself in a good physical environment for listening, away from noise and distractions. And also, put yourself in a good mental environment for listening. Set aside your defenses and preconceived notions so that you are open to communication. Thirdly, listen aggressively. There is a difference between listening passively and listening aggressively. To listen with your heart, your listening has to be active. In his book, It's Your Ship, Captain Michael Abrashoff explains that people are more likely to speak aggressively than to listen aggressively. When he decided to become an intentional listener, it made a huge difference in him and his crew. He wrote, It didn't take me long to realize that my young crew was smart, talented, and full of good ideas that frequently came to nothing because no one in charge had ever listened to them. Like most organizations, the Navy seemed to put managers in a transmitting mode, which minimized their receptivity. They were conditioned to promulgate orders from above, not to welcome suggestions from below. I decided that my job was to listen aggressively and to pick up every good idea the crew had for improving the ship's operation. Some traditionalists might consider this heresy, but it's actually just common sense. After all, the people who do the nuts and bolts work on a ship constantly see things that officers don't. It seemed to me only prudent for the captain to work hard at seeing the ship through the crew's eyes. Something happened in me as a result of those interviews. I came to respect my crew enormously. No longer were they nameless bodies at which I barked orders. I realized that they had hopes, dreams, loved ones, and they wanted to believe that what they were doing was important, and they wanted to be treated with respect. As Abrashoff's attitude changed, his crew transformed, his ship turned around, and the results were astounding. 4. Listen to Understand The fundamental cause of nearly all communication problems is that people don't listen to understand. They listen to reply. If you want to meet others' needs and make them feel like a million bucks, then you need to listen. One of the ironies of becoming a good listener is that listening to others and making them feel understood also has a side benefit. The moment people see that they are being understood, they become more motivated to understand your point of view. Listening with the heart produces a win-win situation in relationships. To apply John's teaching to your own life, forget about trying to get your own point across and put your energy into understanding the other person's point. Ask, how can I better understand what this person is feeling and thinking? Do it. Listen aggressively by eliminating distractions and focusing on the other person's point of view. Remember, the best way to persuade is with your ears. Chapter 16. Find the Keys to Their Hearts. Less. Whenever I spend time with John, I see him connect with people at the heart level immediately. For example, the other day while I was with him, John met with Kirk Nowry, the president of one of John's companies, ISS. Many times when a leader meets with someone who works for him, He or she immediately gets down to business. But the first thing John did was to talk to Kirk about his family. He wanted to know how his wife was doing. He asked about their grown children. John seemed to know all about Kirk's family, and once they had caught up, then they talked business. John does this intuitively with everyone he knows. He asks about many people's spouses and children by name. He inquires about what's happening in a person's church or business and he seems to remember the details. Why? Because he makes it his goal to know what's important to the people who are important to him. John When I was young, I used to believe that everyone ought to be like me in order to be successful. I come to realize with time that I've got major gaps in my skills and abilities, as everyone does, and if people with different talents and temperaments work together, we all win and get a lot more done. We also enjoy the journey of life much more. 
If you have a healthy self-image, you may fall into the same trap I did. However, you cannot win with people if you secretly harbor the belief that everyone ought to be more like you. Accept that people are different and celebrate that God made us that way. Asking a good question is essential to discovering the keys to a person's heart. Through the years, I've developed a list of questions that have helped me in this endeavor time and time again. You may want to use them, too. What do you dream about? You can learn about people's minds by looking at what they've already achieved, but to understand their hearts, look at what they dream of becoming. What do you cry about? When you understand people's pain, you can't help but understand their hearts. What do you sing about? What brings people joy is often a source of their strength. What are your values? When people give you access to their values, know that you have entered the most sacred chamber of their hearts. What are your strengths? Whatever people perceive as their strengths makes their hearts proud. What is your temperament? Learn that, and you often discover the way to their hearts. Obviously, you don't want your questions to feel like an interview, and you don't need to find out all of the answers in one sitting. The process can be natural while being intentional. It's a major leap for some people to tune into others' dreams and desires and to discover the keys to their hearts. But it's not enough to do that once with a person and then think you've got it forever. Time changes all things, including the human heart. What's effective in motivating people at one point in their careers will not necessarily be effective in motivating them later. What touches their hearts at one stage of life may not be the same as they grow older. Successes and failures, tragedies and triumphs, goals achieved and dreams laid to rest all make an impact in a person's values and desires. So what does that mean to someone who wants to win with others by finding the keys to their hearts? It means you should stay in continual conversation with others. Keep connecting on the heart level. Ask about what has touched their hearts up to now. If their responses are different, then you know they are changing and you have a new opportunity to learn about what matters to them now. I need to tell you one more thing about finding the keys to people's hearts, and this is the most important point. Once you have found a key to a person's heart, you must act with integrity, because you have been entrusted with something of great value. Never use it to manipulate someone. Turn the key only when you can add value to that person. To apply John's teaching to your own life, forget about your inclination to believe that everyone is or should be just like you. Ask, what change indicators have I seen in the person whose heart I'd like to understand? Do it. Purposefully try to discover the keys to the hearts of your own inner circle. Remember, leaders who succeed are those who understand the hearts of their team. Chapter 17. Be the first to help. Les, where are you? I just passed the Hotel Del Coronado, and I'm pulling into the complex, I said. What color is your rental car? It's silver, I told John over my cell phone. Okay, I can see you coming up right now, John said. Take an immediate right, and you'll see a parking space that is just now opening up. Where are you, I asked. Look up. John was standing on a balcony of the high-rise building on Coronado Island in San Diego. He had rented a condo, and I had just flown in for a day of meetings with him. Oh, there you are, I started to laugh as I saw him waving at me from the balcony. Only John would think of actually scouting out parking spaces from a bird's-eye view so that he could make it easier for me to find a space. I've long known that offering help to others is a key to winning with people. It's one of the first lessons you'll pick up in any social psychology class. But John puts a new twist on it. He goes out of his way to be helpful, and when someone's in need, he's often the first on the scene. Sometimes it's the little things with John, said employee Ken Coleman. When I'm traveling with him, I've often seen John help someone struggling to get his or her suitcases into the airplane compartment, while most other passengers are oblivious in trying to maneuver around the person. John makes a conscious effort to help in the moment. It seems to be an almost reflexive action with him. John, 
I like helping people. I think it's one of the reasons God put us here on earth. But helping others does more than benefit others. It also helps you win with them. I say that because whenever you're quick to help others, it makes a statement. It's like leaving a calling card they will never forget. So how do you become someone who is the first to help? First, make helping others a priority. We are often so consumed with our own agendas that helping others never becomes important to us. The solution is to make helping others part of your agenda, a top priority. I read recently about something Academy Award winner Tom Hanks did years ago on the set of The Green Mile that shows how helping others is a priority for him. Frank Darabont, director of the film, reflected on Hank's commitment to helping rising actor Michael Duncan achieve his best and the impression it had on him. Darabont said, Fifteen, twenty years from now, what I will remember about filming The Green Mile, there was one thing, and I'll never forget this. As we're shooting, the camera is on Michael Duncan first, and I'm realizing that I'm getting distracted by Hank's. Hanks is delivering an Academy Award-winning performance off-camera for Michael Duncan to give him every possible thing he needs or can use to deliver the best possible performance. He wanted Michael to do so well. He wanted him to look so good. I'll never forget that. Tom Hanks, like some other Hollywood actors, could have been the first to bail out on Duncan. Instead, he was the first to help. It obviously paid off. In 1999, Michael Clark Duncan was nominated for an Academy Award in the Best Actor in a Supporting Role category, and Duncan's career has since taken off. Second, make yourself aware of people's needs. This may sound obvious, but you can't meet a need that you don't know exists. Each of us must begin by caring about the people around us and looking for their needs. Sometimes that knowledge can come from listening with your heart. Sometimes it comes from just paying attention to what's going on around you. Other times it comes from mentally putting yourself in another person's place. There is a Jewish legend that says two brothers once shared a field and a mill, each night dividing the grain they had ground together during the day. One brother lived alone, the other was married with a large family. One day the single brother thought to himself, It isn't fair that we divide the grain evenly. I have only myself to care for, but my brother has children to feed. So each night he secretly took some of his flour to his brother's storehouse. But the married brother considered his brother's situation. But the married brother considered his brother's situation and said to himself, It isn't right that we divide the grain evenly, because I have children to provide for me in my old age, but my brother has no one. What will he do when he is old? So every night he secretly took some of his flour and put it in his brother's stores. As a result, both of the brothers found their supply of grain mysteriously replenished each morning. Then one night they met each other halfway between the two houses. They suddenly realized what the other was doing, and they embraced each other in love. Third, be willing to take a risk. Sometimes helping another person can be a risky proposition, yet that should not keep us from lending a hand. There's a story Ken Sutterfield tells from the 1936 Olympic Games in Berlin, Germany, that illustrates the impact that can be made by taking such a risk. Coming into the Games, American sprinter Jesse Owens had set three world records in one day, including a leap of 26 feet, 8 and a quarter inches on the running broad jump a record that would stand for 25 years. However, Owens faced great pressure during the games. Hitler and his fellow Nazis wanted to use the competition to establish Aryan superiority, and Owens, a black man, could sense the hostility toward him. As Owens tried to qualify for the finals during the games, he became rattled as he saw a tall, blue-eyed, blonde German taking practice jumps in the 26-foot range. On his first jump, Owens leaped from several inches beyond the takeoff board. Then he fouled on the second attempt. He was allowed only one more attempt. If he missed it, he would be eliminated. The tall German approached Owens and introduced himself. His name was Luz Long. As the Nazis watched, Long encouraged Owens and offered him some advice. 
Since the qualifying distance was only 23 feet 5 and a half inches, Long suggested that Owens make a mark several inches before the takeoff board to make sure he didn't foul. Owens qualified on his third jump. In the finals, he set an Olympic record and earned one of his four gold medals. And who was the first person to congratulate Owens? Luz Long. Owens never forgot the help Long had given him, though he never saw Long again. You could melt down all the medals and cups I have, Owens wrote, and they wouldn't be plating on the 24-carat friendship I felt for Luz Long. To apply John's teaching to your own life, forget about, thinking about only what's in it for you, and think about how you can offer a hand. Ask, how can I help you? Do it. Be the first to volunteer your services, offer assistance, or lend a hand. Remember, if you help enough people get what they want, you'll get what you want, too. Chapter 18, Add Value to People John At the core of my being, I believe that there is nothing in this life more important than people. Having embraced that truth, I try to live it out with integrity. To me, that means doing everything in my power to add value to people. It all starts with your attitude toward people. Human relations expert Les Giblin remarked, You can't make the other fellow feel important in your presence if you secretly feel that he is a nobody. Isn't that true? Don't you find it difficult to do something kind for people when you dislike them? The way we see people is often the difference between manipulating and motivating them. If we don't want to help people, yet we want them to help us, then we get in trouble. We manipulate people when we move them for our personal advantage. However, we motivate people when we move them for mutual advantage. Adding value to others is often a win-win proposition. How do you see people? Are they potential recipients of value you can give, or do they tend to be nuisances along your path to success? Author Sidney J. Harris said, People want to be appreciated, not impressed. They want to be regarded as human beings, not as sounding boards for other people's egos. They want to be treated as an end in themselves, not as a means toward the gratification of another's vanity. If you want to add value to people, you have to value them first. You also have to make yourself more valuable. Have you ever heard the phrase, you cannot give what you do not have? There are people who possess good hearts and the desire to give, yet they have very little to offer. Why? Because they have not first added value to themselves. Making yourself more valuable is not an entirely selfish act. When you acquire knowledge, learn a new skill, or gain experience, you not only improve yourself, but you also increase your ability to help others. In 1974, I committed myself to the pursuit of personal growth. I knew that it would help me to be a better minister, so I began to continually read books, listen to tapes, attend conferences, and learn from better leaders. At the time, I had no idea that this commitment would be the most important thing I would ever do to help others, but that has turned out to be the case. As I improve myself, I am better able to help others improve. The more I grow, the more I can help others grow. The same will be true for you. If you want to add value to people, you must make yourself more valuable. And you must know what people value. I make it a standard practice to note what the people in my life value, and you should too. Here are some examples from my own life. Margaret, my wife, values my time with her and my attention. My children, Elizabeth and Joel Porter, value the legacy Margaret and I are leaving them. Larry, my brother, values my prayers and our time together. Eric and Troy, my nephews, value the fatherly advice and unconditional love I give them. Linda, my assistant, values my time and effectiveness because she is an integral part of it. John, the president of my nonprofit organization, Equip, values the leadership and opportunities I give him. Kirk, the president of my company ISS, values my friendship and partnership. I could go on, but I don't want to bore you. The point is that we must take the time to know what our most valuable people value. By the way, 
adding value to others is not only a gift to them, it is a gift to you. The people I have just listed continually add value to my life. Some have given so much to me that no matter how much I do for them, I will never even the score. To apply John's teaching to your own life, forget about trying to become a person of success and instead become a person of value. Ask, who adds value to my life and to whom would I most like to add value? Do it. Make a list of people in your life and note exactly what they value most from you. Remember, if you don't truly value the person, he or she will never feel important in your presence. Chapter 19. Remember a person's story. Less. Less, John will say, tell me about your dad. How are he and your mom doing since they moved to Phoenix? It's just like John to recall that my parents recently moved. And tell me about your brothers, he'll continue. What's the latest with them? John always seems to remember my story, just as he does with so many people. He does it so well, so often, and so consistently. When he has met people, I've heard him flat out ask them to tell him their stories. So I ask him how he learned to be a collector of people's stories. To begin with, I love a good story, whether I'm learning about someone I've just met or hearing about an adventure from someone I've known my whole life. In fact, when I spend time with my dad, who is now 82, our time is always filled with storytelling. We talk about the new things that are happening in our lives, but often the stories are ones I've heard dozens of times. Some dad loves to tell over and over. Others I ask him to tell. Some I love retelling. But you seem to go out of your way to get the story of someone you just met, I commented. That's true. Whenever I have a few minutes with someone, John said, I ask him to tell me his story, because I know that time in the conversation will focus entirely on him, his interests, dreams, uniqueness, disappointments, questions, hopes, his journey. While that person enjoys the personal attention, I gain insight into the keys to his life. Learning a person's story is a great way to connect with him. Remembering his journey and building on it is the greatest way to develop a strong relationship. John There are so many good reasons to learn a person's story. Requesting a person's story says you could be special. Remembering a person's story says you are special. Reminding a person of his or her story says you are special to me. Repeating a person's story to others says you should be special to them. The result? You become special to the person who shared a story with you. There are really just three small steps when it comes to embracing this practice in order to win with people. The key is to cultivate the habit of actually taking these steps with the people in your life. 1. Ask When you meet someone new, after the introductions and initial pleasantries, don't hesitate. Dive in and ask to hear the person's story. You can do it any number of ways. You can flat out ask what's your story. You can request that he tell you about himself. You can ask where he is from or how he got into the field he's in. Use your own style. If you've tried this kind of thing before and you worry that it might be awkward the first few times you do it, then practice with people you are unlikely to see again. The driver in a cab, the passenger on a plane, a waitress in a restaurant. Once you become comfortable asking questions of total strangers, the rest will be easy. 2. Listen Years ago, I came across a list of suggestions for good listening. I think I clipped it from bits and pieces. Here were some of the tips. Look the speaker in the eye. Be attentive. Don't roll your eyes or grimace when you hear something you don't agree with. Don't interrupt. Try phrases like, Go on, or I see, instead of, now that reminds me. Tell the speaker what you think you heard. Begin by saying, let me see if I understand. The main idea is to really focus on the other person. The problem many people have is that while the other person speaks, they are thinking more about what they want to say when it's their turn, instead of focusing on listening. When you give people your undivided attention, then you are in a better position to achieve the next step. 3. Remember 
Some people have a knack for numbers, others for names or faces, but just about everyone has the capacity to remember a story. If we care about people, really listen to them and try to remember their stories, we can make an impact on them, and we can make them feel like a million bucks. To apply John's teaching to your own life, forget about telling your own story and listen to the story of others. Ask, what's your story? Do it. Bring up some aspect of a person's story the next time you see him or her. Remember, everyone loves to tell his story. Chapter 20. Share a Good Story. Less. John always tells a good story in front of an audience as well as one-on-one, and he uses lots of stories when he communicates. So I ask him why. That's easy. Stories stick. Principles fade, said John. If you want people to remember what you said, tell a story. Let me tell you something else, he continued. It took a while for me to learn the lesson about stories in my writing. I'm so bottom line that I used to just teach principles without many stories. But a friend convinced me to change my style, and it's made a big difference for my readers. As a writer, you've got to ask yourself, will the reader turn the page? The person most likely will if I am telling a good story. I haven't met a person yet who doesn't love a good story. That's one of the reasons storytellers are so magnetic. John. Invariably, the person who tells the best stories becomes the one to whom others turn their attention. Storytelling is a skill that comes with practice, and anyone can learn to develop it. First, share something you've experienced. The stories we tell are the best ones we've lived. We care about them, we know the material, and we know how they have affected us. And we can shape and embellish them any way we want. Everybody has had experiences that others would be interested in. Second, tell it with the goal of connecting. The people who have the toughest time telling stories are the ones who try to impress others with them. If that describes you, then change your goal. Tell stories with the purpose of connecting with others. Put the focus on the listener, and your storytelling skills will improve overnight. Third, put your heart into it. People love humor, but not everyone can tell a funny story. If you can, go with it but never underestimate the power of a story from the heart. If you want to tell a connecting story, make it warm. Put your heart into it. And don't be afraid to show people that you care about what you're talking about. Fourth, assume that others want to hear it. One of the biggest mistakes novice storytellers make is being tentative. Nothing makes a story go flat more quickly than a timid delivery. If you're going to tell a story, be bold, be energetic, Be engaging. Go for it, or don't go at all. I've read that the elite often criticized President Lincoln for telling too many stories, but he didn't let it stop him because he knew what worked with people. He remarked, They say I tell a great many stories. I reckon I do. But I have found in the course of a long experience that common people take to them as they run, are more easily informed through the medium of a broad illustration than in any other way. And as to what the hypercritical few may think, I don't care. Follow the lead of Lincoln and other great leaders who knew how to win with people. Tell a good story, engage them at the heart level, and win them over. To apply John's teaching to your own life, forget about being a professional storyteller. Ask, how can I make my point come through stronger with a story? Do it. Tell a story instead of relaying only facts. Remember, stories stick, principles fade. Chapter 21, Give with No Strings Attached John Pierre Teilhard de Chardin said the most satisfying thing in life is to have been able to give a large part of oneself to others. Anyone who has unselfishly helped another person knows this to be true. Yet not everyone is able to adopt an ongoing mindset of giving toward others. Why is that? First of all, I believe it has nothing to do with circumstances. I have met generous people with almost nothing who are willing to share what little they possessed. And I have met well-off people who were stingy with their time, money, and talents. 
The issue is really attitude. I found that people who enjoy giving with no strings attached usually exhibit two characteristics that anyone can embrace. One, they have an abundance mentality. If you've read Stephen Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, then you are familiar with the concepts related to scarcity and abundance mindsets. In a nutshell, people with scarcity mindset believe that in life there is only a limited supply of anything to go around, whether it's money, resources, opportunity, and so forth. And they see the world as a pie with a limited number of slices. Once they're gone, they're gone. As a result, they fight to get their peace, and once they have it, they protect it. People possessing an abundance mindset believe that there is plenty of everything to go around. If life is a pie and others are helping themselves to pieces, the solution of the person with the abundance mindset is to bake another pie. There is always more money to be made, more or different resources to be discovered, additional opportunities to be pursued. An old solution isn't working anymore? Don't worry, someone will find a new one. The inventors, entrepreneurs, and explorers of the world are continually creating new pies so that everyone can get a slice. My own take on this is that people tend to fall into one of two categories. They are either takers or makers. Takers are people who take, grab, and consume whatever they can to meet their own needs. They see life as a rat race. Of course, the main problem with that is that even if you win, you're still a rat. Makers, on the other hand, are people who give, create, and make things happen. They create progress and foster success for others. They are just as likely to give as to take because they are continually helping to create more for everyone. People who habitually give with no strings attached almost always have an abundance mentality. They are generous because they believe that if they give, they will not run out of resources. Someone once asked me why he should adopt an abundance mentality, and he was surprised by my answer. I told him that if you believe in abundance, that's what life gives you. If you believe in scarcity, then that's what you get. I don't know why that is, but after 50 years of paying attention to people's attitudes and watching how life unfolded for them, I know it to be true. So if you desire to be more generous, change your thinking and your attitude when it comes to abundance. Not only will it allow you to be more generous, but also it will change your life. Two, they see the big picture. People who give with no strings attached are usually aware of the help they have received along the way. They recognize that they are standing on the shoulders of previous generations. The progress they make is due, at least in part, to the work and sacrifice of those who have gone before them. Because of this, they are determined to do for the next generation what was done for them. To become better givers, we need greater perspective. When we realize how much we have benefited from the kindness of others, it becomes much easier for us to be generous. And one of the best things is that giving is so rewarding. When we give unselfishly, we will gain something in return. To apply John's teaching to your own life, forget about scarcity. Instead, focus on abundance. Ask, whom can I help that will give nothing in return? Do it. Be purposely kind and generous to a specific person. Remember, you do yourself the most good when you are doing something good for others. Chapter 22, Learn Your Mailman's Name, Less. John tells a story about how he used to memorize the names of people who attended his church when he was the senior pastor of Skyline Wesleyan Church in San Diego, California. He used to make an offer to visitors. If they would allow someone to take their picture on Sunday after the service, John promised to learn their names by the following Sunday. John did that until he finished his tenure at the church in 1995. Fulfilling that promise, John was able to memorize the names of more than 2,200 people and greet them by name. I've long admired the skill and personal approach of John's. In fact, it inspired me in my work as a professor to learn the names of several hundred students in my classes each semester at the university. Why do we do it? 
because we know that a person's name is his personal signboard to the world, his most intimate, distinctive possession. And when you remember a person's name, it can make him or her feel like a million bucks. John, how do you feel when someone calls you by the wrong name? How about when you kindly correct the person and spend time with him and he still gets your name wrong? How about when people haven't seen you for a long time and they still remember your name? Doesn't it make you feel good? And doesn't it also impress you? When people care enough to know your name, they make you feel valued. My friend Jerry Lucas is known as Dr. Memory. He has spent the years following his hugely successful run in the NBA, helping school children and adults improve their memories through a variety of innovative techniques. One of the things he teaches is called the SAVE method. Here's how it works. S. Say the name three times in conversation. A. Ask a question about the name, for example, how it's spelled, or about the person. V. Visualize the person's prominent physical or personality feature. E. End the conversation with the name. Years ago, Jerry showed how useful his method could be by remembering the names of every guest in the audience at The Tonight Show. I believe it can also help you remember the first and last names of the people you meet. Almost everyone has trouble recalling names on some occasion. When this happens, try to recall the situation in which you met the person or last saw him or her. If you can't recall even that, then ask, how long has it been? Perhaps that will jog your memory. If you're meeting people along with a friend or colleague, sometimes you can help each other out. Introduce the person whose name you do remember to the person whose name you don't, and perhaps the individual volunteer his name. Or you can agree with your friend ahead of time to come to each other's aid. My wife and I do this. When we make introductions, Margaret knows that if I don't introduce someone by name, I'm not sure I remember it correctly, and she will quickly introduce herself and get the other person's name in return. When all else fails, just say, I'm so sorry, I remember you well, but I'm afraid your name has slipped my mind. Then, after the individual reminds you, use the save method so that you're less likely to forget it again in the future. If you work at it, you will become better at remembering people's names. Don't be too hard on yourself, however, when you blow it. That's what I did recently when meeting a couple whose last name was Lake. One of the things I do when learning a name is to link the name to a mental image. When I was introduced to the lakes, I immediately placed a mental image of a lake on their heads and thought of Hargus Lake, where I grew up. A few days later, when I saw them again, I mistakenly asked, How are you doing tonight, Mr. and Mrs. Hargus? Sometimes even our best practices fail us. To apply John's teaching to your own life, forget about. Blaming your bad memory and exert some effort to remember people's names. Ask, what can you tell me about the origin of your name or how it's spelled? Do it. Use the save method with each new person you meet this week. Remember, a person's name is one of his or her most valuable possessions. Chapter 23. Point out people's strengths. John. People often make a mistake on their personal development when they focus too much on their weaknesses. As a result, they spend all their time trying to shore up those weaknesses instead of maximizing the strengths they possess. Similarly, it's a mistake to focus on the weaknesses of others. The self-proclaimed experts who can tell others what's wrong with them never win with people. Most people simply avoid them. Instead, we need to focus on finding people's strengths and pointing them out. People are motivated in their areas of strength. When you work in your areas of strength, you don't need much external motivation. If people have been grinding away at tasks in their weak areas and they are reassigned to work in areas of strength, watch their motivation, their enthusiasm, and their productivity skyrocket. People add the most value in their strength zones. It took the first five years of my professional life to figure out what my strengths were. But with the passing of years since then, I've narrowed my focus down to fewer and fewer things. The law of the niche in my book, The 17 Indisputable Laws for Teamwork, states, 
All players have a place where they add the most value. That place is their strength zone. I'm worthless at most things, but I do about four things really well, and as much as possible, I stick to those things. As a leader and employer, I try to help others do the same. I help them find their strength zones, and I try to position them there as much as possible. You see, a successful person finds the right place for himself, but a successful leader finds the right place for others. How do I do that? First, I look for the best in others. Anybody can see weaknesses, mistakes, and shortcomings in others. That's no unique skill. Seeing only the good things is harder. Hall of Fame baseball player Reggie Jackson said that the best Major League Baseball leaders possess that ability. He observed, a great manager has a knack for making ball players think they are better than they think they are. He forces you to have a good opinion of yourself. He lets you know he believes in you. He makes you get more out of yourself. And once you learn how good you really are, you never settle for playing anything less than your very best. That's true in any area of life, business, parenting, marriage, ministry, and so forth. Don't look for the flaws, warts, and blemishes in others. Look for their best. Second, I speak up. You can think the world of others, but if you never actually tell them, then you don't really help them. I have always believed that all people have a success seed within them. Most never find it and therefore fail to reach their potential. I often look at another person and ask, what is his success seed? When I discover it, I point it out to that person. Then I fertilize it with encouragement and water it with opportunity. You can do the same. To apply John's teaching to your own life, forget about others' weaknesses. Ask, what does this individual do exceptionally well? Do it. Every day this week, Tell at least one person what strength you see in him or her. Remember, every person in the world possesses the seeds for success. Chapter 24 Write Notes of Encouragement Less In 1791, William Wilberforce was facing one more discouraging defeat in his attempt to abolish Britain's slave trade, John told me when we were looking at a framed copy of a letter written by John Wesley. Then he received a letter from John Wesley. That now famous letter would prove to be a continuing source of strength for the rest of his life. Here's how it read. London, February 26, 1791. Dear Sir, Unless the divine power has raised you up, I see not how you can go through your glorious enterprise in opposing that execrable villainy which is the scandal of religion, of England, and of human nature. Unless God has raised you up for this very thing, you will be worn out by the opposition of men and devils. But if God be for you, who can be against you? Are all of them stronger than God? Oh, be not weary in well-doing. Go on, in the name of God and in the power of His might, till even American slavery, the vilest that ever saw the sun, shall vanish away before it. That He who has guided you from your youth up may continue to strengthen you in this in all things is the prayer of your affectionate servant, J. Wesley. Four days after writing that letter, John recounted, Wesley was dead and once again Wilberforce was defeated when the vote was taken in Parliament. Ultimately, Wilberforce prevailed, but in the intervening years, he was vilified and faced so many disappointments. His opponents even arranged for him to be challenged to a duel and made an attempt to kill him. John continued, He was tempted to give up the fight more than once, but every time he became discouraged, he returned to Wesley's letter. Each time he read it, it was like the first time. It never failed to encourage and strengthen him. If you don't believe in the encouraging power of the written note after hearing about that, John said, you probably never will. I can attest to the fact that John believes in that power. I've received several notes of encouragement from him over the years, and I still have many of them. They may not hold the historical value of Wesley's note to Wilberforce, but their value to me is priceless. John, 
If you haven't already guessed, I'm a real history buff. Let me tell you the rest of the story. In 1806, after working tirelessly for 20 years, Wilberforce finally succeeded in getting a bill passed that abolished the slave trade. Twenty-eight years later, on July 31, 1834, slavery itself was outlawed throughout the British Empire, freeing approximately 800,000 slaves. Although he did not live to see the realization of his dream, having died on August 5, 1833, no one was more responsible than William Wilberforce for the demise of slavery in the British Empire. Wilberforce devoted his entire life and political career to a great cause, ending slavery. Yet he might not have prevailed had it not been for the encouraging note of John Wesley. Written notes don't have to come from someone famous to be encouraging. A kind word given from the heart is always well received. If you've never mastered the practice of sending handwritten notes to people, then I want to encourage you to try this often neglected way of winning with people. Today we communicate by telephone, digital pager, cell phone, fax machine, email, and the Internet. In the hectic pace of our busy lives, who has time to correspond the old-fashioned way? Yet the more convenient our communication becomes, the more temporary it is. We forget how meaningful that personal touch can be. Few things beat opening a mailbox and pulling out a real note written by a real person. When you see the thoughts of someone you respect written in his or her own hand, it really means something. Six days a week, regular mail service is provided by the United States Postal Service. Annually, postal workers handle 170 billion pieces of mail. Yet, in this huge sea of mail, officials say personal letters account for less than 4% of the total. So, on average, you will have to wade through 25 pieces of mail before you put your hands on one that contains a personal word. More than ever in this day and age, a handwritten note communicates that you care. You can never tell when something you write to others will lighten them up in down times or sustain them when life gets difficult. In the first Chicken Soup for the Soul book, teacher sister Helen Rosla recounted how a spur-of-the-moment assignment in class became a source of encouragement for her students. On a day when her junior high math students were especially ornery, she asked them to write down what they liked about each of their fellow students. She then compiled the results over the weekend and handed out the lists on the following Monday. Years later, when one of those students, Mark, was killed in Vietnam, she and some of those former students got together for the funeral. Afterward, Mark's father told the group they found this on Mark when he was killed, and he showed them a folded, refolded, and taped paper, the one he had received years before from his teacher. Right after that, Charlie, one of Mark's classmates, said, I keep my list in my desk drawer. Chuck's wife said, Chuck put his in our wedding album. I have mine too, Marilyn said, in my diary. Standing there, Vicky reached into her pocketbook and brought out her frazzled list, showing it to her teacher and former classmates. Each person cherished the kind words of encouragement they had received. That's the power of a few kind words. To apply John's teaching to your own life, forget about being a perfect writer and focus on writing from the heart. Ask, what can I say that will be an encouragement now as well as someday in the future? Do it. Take one hour today to write several notes to people for the sole purpose of encouraging them. Remember, words have the power to give encouragement long after the writer has forgotten them. Chapter 25 Help People Win John Helping another person to win is one of the greatest feelings in the world. I haven't met a person yet who doesn't like to win, and everyone I know who's made the effort to help others has said that it is the most rewarding part of life. After a conference in Toledo, the man came up to me and asked a pointed question. How do I get unbelievable results from a person? Have unbelievable expectations about that person was my answer. If you don't believe in people, then you are unlikely to do everything you can to help them win. People know when someone doesn't believe in them. They see right through pretense and insincere backslapping. But when they know you believe in them, magic begins to happen. 
A reporter asked Prime Minister Winston Churchill, who led Britain during the dark moments of the Second World War, what was the greatest weapon his country possessed against the Nazi regime of Hitler. Without pausing for even a moment, Churchill said, it was what England's greatest weapon has always been, hope. Hope is one of the most powerful and energizing words in the English language. It is something that gives us power to keep going in the toughest of times. And its power energizes us with excitement and anticipation as we look toward the future. It's been said that a person can live 40 days without food, 4 days without water, 4 minutes without air, but only 4 seconds without hope. If you want to help people win, then become a purveyor of hope. Focus on the process, not just the win. Which wins are the most satisfying, the easy ones or the ones we really have to work for? When you help somebody win, don't just hand it to him, even if it's in your power to do so. Help him win. If you assist him in the process, then you're not just giving him the victory, you're giving him the means for additional future victories. He can win and win again. And the only thing sweeter than a win is a whole bunch of wins. Recognize that when you help others win, you also win. In 1984, Lou Whitaker led the first All-American team to the summit of Mount Everest. After months of grueling effort, five members of the team reached the final campsite at 27,000 feet. With 2,000 feet to go, they met in a crowded tent. Whitaker had a tough decision to make. He knew how highly motivated all five climbers were to stand on the highest point on earth. But two would have to go back to the previous camp, load up food, water, and oxygen, then return to the camp where they now met. After completing this support assignment, these two climbers would be in no condition to make a try for the summit. The others would stay in the tent that day to drink water, breathe oxygen, and rest, preparing them for the summit attempt the next day. The first decision Whitaker made was to stay at the 27,000-foot camp to coordinate the team's activities. The next was to send the two strongest climbers down the mountain to get the supplies. It was the tougher job. The two weaker climbers would rest, renew their strength, and receive the glory of the summit. When asked why he didn't assign himself the summit run, His answer showed his understanding of people and the strength of his leadership. He said, My job was to put other people on top. Whitaker understood that when people make the right decisions that help the team to achieve its goal, everybody wins. You can't help winning when you help others win. To apply John's teaching to your own life, forget about Approaching life as a competition where you have to beat everyone else in order to win. Ask, whom would I most like to help win and how can I do it? Do it. Make a game plan. Chart the road you will travel together on your way to victory. Remember, once you help someone win, you will have a friend for life. John All my life I believe that anyone can learn to win with people. All it takes is a belief in people and a sincere desire to help them. I hope that after listening to this book, you believe that too. You may not feel instantly comfortable doing some of the principles in this book, but there isn't a single one you can't master. And of course, keep adding other practices that you learn on your own or from others. You can never learn too many ways to win with people. Here's to your success. May you keep winning by helping others win. Thanks for listening to the audio for 25 Ways to Win with People, written by John C. Maxwell and Les Parrott, and copyrighted by John C. Maxwell. This program was published by Nelson Business, a division of Thomas Nelson Publishers, Nashville, Tennessee. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.